Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Edward Kui. I'm the director of uh, Nanhai Arts. On behalf of Nanhai, I would like to uh, welcome all the guests and friends from uh, here in San Francisco Bay Area, from New York and East Coast, and from China. It's uh, my great pleasure you know, to co-host this event in collaboration with Thospis. And it's such a rare opportunity to see the wonderful you know, collections, short collection. Before it goes to New York, and then maybe it goes to private or public collections next month. So uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you have enjoyed the preview during the reception. And I hope some of you, some of us here today, will go to New York, win the bid, and bring the pennies back to <laughs> California. <laughs> then we have another baby to uh, the family to enjoy this pennies. So uh, I will just stop here. I will give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Fang Xian, the head of uh, sales of uh, Sotheby's uh, in New York, and Mr. Fang, your floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for um, coming to this um, opening and uh, traveling exhibition of the True Family Collection of Chinese Paintings today. We are so honored to um, to have the chance to present this wonderful collection. I remember, you know, back like two years ago when I first got in touch with this collection, and we, you know, um, I talked with Sister Asha on the phone. She was such a nice lady. I, you know, I enjoyed talking with her so much, and uh, you know, it's a uh, uh, it's such a wonderful opportunity. And uh, here we now we have we are um, um, our senior um, consultant Ms. Anna Chang and uh, professor of art um, um, professor uh, Mark Dean Johnson uh, is going to give us uh, this um, lecture about Zhang Da Qian and uh, okay I'll just hand the uh, microphones to them. <laughs> Hello, this is Mark. Yes. 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 You can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I don't have to use that. <coughs> So, I'm, uh, my name is Arnold Chang, Arnold Chang, Tom Holm, whatever, however, however you want. Uh, I've, I've actually been at Nanhai several times. I wear several hats, and, and uh, one time I came as an artist, and one time I came as talking about connoisseurship. But today is the most fun. Today I'm here as a fan. And I'm a fan of Nanhai. Um, Nanhai, of course, their slogan is uh, bridging east and west, which of course means China and the U.S., but it also means the east coast and the west coast. So I, it, I th thought it was a perfect opportunity uh, for Sotheby's to work with Nanhai because this is the best place for exhibiting this collection that actually comes from California. And I'm also a fan of Chinese painting and a fan of Zhang Da Chen. So uh, here's a, a, a photo of uh, Fang Chen, who was just talking. Uh, he I, he and, uh, is, I think, praying to the wall that the, <laughs> that the blue and green splash painting will, will, will arrive in time. I don't know. Uh, some of you, you came early. You, you, you might have seen that the painting arrived just about half an hour before. <laughs> the, uh, the so I guess the prayer worked. <laughs> So this is the guy we're talking about. Uh, John Dachan, I think all of you know. He's, he's not a stranger to this crowd, uh, but uh, he was a fa fabulous artist and a, a great personality. Uh, I know there are members of, of John's family in the audience, so I'm not going to claim any, any you know, real knowledge of, about him except to say that he was one of my idols as a kid growing up. Uh, Here's another, here's another photo, and the reason I included this one is because this, this little girl in the middle here is, uh, is Sing, Zhang Xinxuan. Uh, oh, that helps. And uh, I, I include her for a very particular reason, which you will see shortly. Now, why, how did I get involved in this, and what am I doing here, and, and, and uh, you know, it begins when I'm a nine-year-old. My father takes me to an exhibition in New, in New York in, at the Herschel and Adler Gallery of all places, which was not certainly not a, a, a gallery for Asian art, it was a gallery for contemporary and, and modern painting. 
And here I was, I went with my dad, I didn't know anything about Chinese art. We, even though my, chi my parents owned a fabulous Chinese restaurant, uh, we three brothers didn't eat Chinese food, we didn't speak Chinese, we didn't really uh, know very much about Chinese culture at all. So I went with my dad, who of course was one of those you know, typical Chinese fathers who, who was uh, working in the restaurant all the time, uh, didn't have much time to do things with us, you know, blah, 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 immigrant store, all that. But here it was, for some reason, he decided to take me to this show. And I have to say, it, it just blew my mind and opened my mind to a whole world which I have pursued ever since. And it, I, I, I've told this story before, but I, I keep repeating it because it, at this point, you know, I have a 10-year-old uh, granddaughter and a 7-year-old grandson, and I'm thinking, you know, it's amazing what, what can happen when you're a young child and you're exposed to something. You never know what is going to be that thing that, that just shifts your entire life. So, I, you know, we try to give our grandchildren as many experiences as possible and uh, we'll see where it goes. So, this was the exhibition. Uh, at the time, I didn't have this catalog. Uh, and, and just a few years ago, I had to buy it on eBay or something, it cost me 80 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did have the brochure from that show, which that was free, free of charge, so I kept this all these years. And, and uh, interestingly, there was a, a blurb written by a man named James Cahill, who some of you may know, uh, and, uh, and, you know, was going, he'll turn up again uh, shortly because he ended up being my thesis advisor when I went to UC Berkeley and, and studied uh, Chinese art history. So in that blurb, this, this, is, the, this is the one that, uh, this is the section that is oft repeated where Cahill refers to uh, the, the master of the East and the master of the West in some sort of a, a kind of summit meeting of the painting world. And this, this was a line that uh, Cahill wrote and it's repeated over and over again, and I think it was a very good point of, of, of propaganda for John Dachian to, you know, to, to, to uh, and, and it's a very famous photograph of him with Picasso. So, I was nine at the time I saw this exhibition, and it stuck in my head, you know, I, did, I was doing other things and being a kid, and then in sixth grade, a couple years later, uh, we, we had a, a teacher who, who was very interested in, in art history and music history, and each of us had to do a little report on, a, uh, on an artist, and he gave us a list of names, and it included all the big names, Rembrandt, Picasso, Van Gogh, et cetera, et cetera. And it was all a bunch of white dudes, uh, <laughs> plus Mary Cassatt. And, and, th and then I thought, you know, so I, interestingly, I was assigned Picasso. So I did my report on Picasso, but then I thought, you know, how come all these guys are, are, are these white guys? What, aren't there any other artists? And I thought back, oh, my dad took me to this show a couple of years ago. What was that guy's name? John Dutchett. So I did a little research. Now, remember, we didn't have Wikipedia. We didn't have Google, you know. And there was very little written about John Dutchett in English. But I did the best I could and, you know, wrote this. This is the actual paper on loose leaf paper. Handwriting, not too bad. <laughs> and this is the important part. Not only is Zhang Chen a great artist, but he is probably one of the greatest collectors of Chinese paintings. After 40 years, he has hundreds of great and valuable masterpieces. He now has a beautiful home here, a home in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he lives and works. He even has his own cook. So those were the things that were most, most important to me at the time, that, that uh, he had a collection of Chinese paintings and he has his own cook. And now, in, in, in the sixth grade class, uh, you know, usually one, one, one student would do the, the uh, little report, and the other student, and another student would do a portrait. So when I did Picasso, some other student did a portrait of Picasso. But since I was doing this all on my own volition, I did the portrait as well. <laughs> so that, that was probably the height of my, my artistic career, but I was still plugging along nonetheless. So there are a lot of ironies here. Years later, I, I came to UC Berkeley, and this is where the California connection finally comes in, and I studied with James Cahill at UC Berkeley. 
who then introduced me. Of course, James Cahill was a good friend of John Chen, and he introduced me to this gentleman, Wang Ji Chen, C.C. Wong, who was also a good friend of John Chen. So even though I didn't get a chance to study with John Chen directly, I knew a lot of his friends. Now, another irony, uh, I, I had to support myself, and I moved back. Oh, actually, so I'm, Cahill introduced me to C.C. Wong. And I was in the, uh, in the master's program at Berkeley, and I was going to go co continue to get a PhD in art history. That was the plan. Then I met C.C. Wong. And I took a little detour. Instead of going, you know, going on in the art history program, I decided I would go back to New York, study with C.C. for a little while, come back to Berkeley, get my PhD, and continue the plan. Well, 25 years elapsed, and I never made it back. <laughs> because I, I went to New York to study with CC. So I had to figure out a way to make a living, and I managed to, to get a, a job at, at uh, Sotheby's, which was then Sotheby Park Burnett. Um, and it was, it was very fortuitous because at the time, CC Wong was already a consultant there. So for the next 15 years, CC Wong got paid to teach me, and I got paid to learn. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a bad deal at all. Now, at some point in 1961, uh, I got a call from somebody at the, at the Reader's Digest Corporation. Remember them? It used to be a big deal, Reader's Digest. Um, and they had a corporate collection, and they happened to have, they owned this painting uh, in the Reader's Digest corporate collection. And they called me up, and I drove up, or I couldn't drive. Somehow I got to Chappaqua, where their, where their uh, uh, headquarters were. And the, the curator pulls out this enormous painting, six scrolls, each one this big, and, and says, well, this doesn't fit in our collection, and we'd like to get rid of it. Oh. And so I said, this is the painting that I saw in the Herschel, Ga Herschel Adler Gallery show in 1963. It was amazing coincidence, and of course I was able to, to put it up for auction and in, in 1961. Uh, it was actually served as the cover for for the catalog, and in those days there weren't there weren't uh, separate sales of Chinese paintings. Chinese paintings were thrown in the back of the ceramics auctions. <laughs> but Jim Lally, some of you know him, was was uh, the head of Chinese works of art at the time, and he suggested that I use this as a wraparound cover for the catalog, which we did, and it sold for a world record price. Ready? $77,000! <laughs> so, because that painting came up for sale, I happened to go to Taiwan, and through the introduction of my classmate, Sing, I got finally to meet my idol, to meet the master. Now, here's a photo. That little girl who, would, who I showed in the second picture, that's her there. And she introduced me to her father, and we strolled around a little. That's my wife. The other beautiful lady. So, so you know, don't, it's not. Remember, nowadays everybody has iPhones and 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 things. In those days, you actually had to have a camera. So she fortunately had some kind of Instamatic or something. And those are the only photos. So that was the only time I got to meet the master. Okay, getting back to John Chen in California. Uh, I wasn't here yet, but one of the great shows here in California was this retrospective in the, uh, in, the, in the Asian Art Museum, at that time the Avery Brunage Collection, uh, in 1972. And I thought they did a really interesting job by showing works from, uh, at least one work from each year of, of, uh, of Zhang's uh, oeuvre from 1928 up to 1970. And I didn't get to see the show, but I, I did have a copy of the catalog. So. Now we get to the Chu collection, and why, why I have any involve, uh, involvement with this. Now this, this is, you just saw in the little film, that's Wang Jingshan, the, the famous photographer on the left, and <coughs> Joan Chu, and uh, Xu Wenbo, and, uh, and Zhang Chen, and in, right in the middle, this is Francis, who, was, who we know as sis, Sister Asha, and that's Thomas Chu. So, I got a call, I was still at Sotheby's, and this was later in my career, in the, like 1991 or so, and I, I, uh, was, I came down to Carmel to take a look at some paintings that Sister Asha uh, had wanted to uh, offer for sale on behalf of her mother, actually a foundation, and 
I was able to, to get this painting, which is one of my favorites. I don't have a great photo of it. Uh, and uh, Sister Asha was, was quite a remarkable woman, uh, a, a nun um, who was, although she was, you know, charitable and soft and, 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 and lovely, she was also very tough. I mean, it was a, a very interesting experience negotiating with her about about the paintings and, and, and the as estimates and the and you know the reserves and all that. And she had set up a charitable trust for her mom, which was very unusual in those days. Chinese painting people were not that savvy, so she was a great mixture. She actually was a PhD in French literature, a really interesting lady who became a nun. Anyway. Uh, she did consign this piece, and it was a, a beautiful painting that, that was eventually sold in Sotheby's Hong Kong. And uh, it gave me a great excuse to show this, this photo of, of uh, me with a beautiful lady. Of course, I'm talking about me sitting long over here. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other girl was pretty cute, too, Lin Chi <laughs> So this brings me to 1999, when I came out here. To, to view an exhibition and attend a symposium that was organized by our, our real guest here, who, who is uh, sitting here, uh, Mark Johnson. Uh, and it was a wonderful exhibition uh, and, and series of talks by a lot of in interesting and famous people. So that's how I got to meet Mark. And uh, since then, we've been in touch over the years. And he was very, 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 uh, I'm very honored that he was able to come here, and he's going to—he's going to be the real star of the show. But uh, I just wanted to mention that we, we met in 1999 when there was a lot of activity around John Dutch Chen. So there's a long history of John Dutch Chen in California. Uh, China Art Center. I don't know who those two ladies are, on, but but they were in there when years later, just last year, somebody uh, uh, contacted Sotheby's and said. Uh, you know, we've, we've been, we, we are the executors of this as an estate, and uh, we, we need to deal with this stuff. And the, the place was uh, not in the best condition, um, and there, you know, we went downstairs. So I had been there back in 91 and saw a few paintings, but I didn't realize that there was a vault downstairs uh, with lots of stuff, including this really big painting that's downstairs on view and as far as I know, has never been exhibited or published. Uh, of, of, it's a, a, a landscape in splash style, painted in 1966, uh, 1968, when, when John, was, this was a kind of transitional period, and if I'm wrong here, somebody here can certainly correct me, but, but he was going back and forth between Brazil and, and California. Uh, so it, it indicate on, indicates in the inscription that this was painted in the Wu Tinghu, the, the, uh, the five pavilion uh, uh, lake. And here's actually a photo of, of Zhang Da Chen at, at the Wu Tinghu. So I came back with Fang Xian and we, we uh, looked at the collection and, and were very shocked to find the high quality and, and range of, of the works, not just by Zhang Da Chen, but some other early masters, uh, some, some uh, contemporary masters, and some uh, Ming and Qing paintings as well. And, uh, well, we packed it up and took it away, basically. <laughs> <laughs> now, recently, a few months ago, I was in Taipei, and uh, I got to see the, uh, this painting, which is one of John Chen's great masterpieces, uh, that was on view in the, in the Palace Museum in Taipei. And it's a huge painting. This, gives you some idea of the scale. And this, this I think, really is one of the, the finest works. Uh, it's kind of an unfinished painting. He, he worked really hard on, on it in, in the late years of his life and never quite completed it. But even in its unfinished, in some ways, in the unfinished state, there's, there's something really beautiful about it. And in fact, when we compare these two paintings, uh, there's a relationship there. Uh, I think that the, the, the one on the left, which is a detail of of the famous Mount Wu painting, he's he's by this point, at late in his career, he's he's been able to integrate a little bit more of, of kind of traditional ink painting techniques with with the kind of splashed abstract style. Uh, but you know that took a long time, and I think the the one that we showed downstairs is actually 
quite striking in, in that it's clearly a transition point where, where he's developing uh, to, to its fullest an international style. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Mark Dean Johnson, who uh, I should mention is a professor at San Francisco State University. Some of you know him and gallery director, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the great contributions he's made in addition to the Zhang Da Chen exhibition is, is this book along with Gordon Zhang uh, on Asian American art. So it's a subject that, that uh, needs uh, more attention. And, Questions? Next. Questions? No questions. Let's wait. Let's wait for <laughs> you, You're going to do your presentation, and then we'll, we'll both ask each other questions if we have time. Oh, and also, we're going to end. We, 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 Mark has brought a, a beautiful film that uh, he'll, he'll explain also. So I'm very honored to be here, and I first want to thank Arnold for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to share a podium with Arnold Song and uh, to speak in front of all of you. Uh, there are many people in the audience that I've known for a while. Uh, I'm happy to see you again and happy to meet people that I haven't met before. Um, and I especially also want to recognize the family of Zhang Dachen that are here today. What I'm going to principally do is to talk about a film, and we will be showing the 21-minute film momentarily, but I just wanted to set it up so that people understood uh, what we were watching, and I gave a little title to it, is that there were giants in Carmel. And uh, I think we should dedicate our remarks tonight to the memory of Sister Asha, who herself was a giant. Uh, we connected because she had been at Yale and I was a student at Yale. We had many things in common. She was a great intellectual as well as a Catholic nun, and it was a complicated package. <laughs> but um, my background is that uh, I've been a teacher at San Francisco State with, for many years, which has a majority Chinese-American student body. So when I got the job there, it uh, behooved me to become involved with the study of the uh, contribution of Chinese artists in America. We did one big show where we showed Don Kingman and other artists, and then uh, it was clear that there was this other huge history of classical Chinese painting in America that no one had done much work on, and at the very top of the mountain, the top of the pinnacle, is of course the work of Zhang Da Chen, who moved to California. If you ask Michael Sullivan, he said he was living here in 1965 because that's when I started to talk with him about the exhibition that we would present at Stanford in 1967. But in 1965 and 1966 and 1967, he stayed at the Dolores Lodge, or he stayed in Sam Wu Hotel in San Francisco. He did not own his own place. So we're going to be taking a trip back to the Dolores Lodge Motel, which is the site, of, which is the site of the film that we're going to uh, screen shortly. And the film happened because of the brilliant leadership of Michael Sullivan. Some of you today, I think, in the audience will remember Michael. Uh, he was an incredibly brilliant and generous man who had spent a lot of time in China. Uh, he married his wife there in 1941. He met Zhang Da Chen in 1943, just after he came back from Dunhuang. And when uh, Michael, Michael took a job teaching at Stanford and uh, did a lot of projects about Chinese painting at Stanford while he was there. But Michael always said, whenever you talk about me, be sure to credit his wife, Quan, as he said, Quan had a lot of boyfriends in her life, <laughs> and she spoke every dialect. So he said, the real reason we were so close to Zhang Da Chen is because Quan spoke Sichuanese, and he loved to speak with her. So I recognize them both 
today. And so Michael organized this big exhibition that happened at Stanford, and these are pictures from the exhibition in 1967. But at the same time, Zhang Dachen mounted an incredibly revolutionary exhibition of his flash paintings at the Lackey Gallery in Carmel. And both of these paintings were in on display in the first 1967 exhibition. The huge Swiss landscape is 12 feet wide, so it's twice the size of the projected image on the screen, and then the small painting is only 18 by 24 inches. But they both reference a trip to the Swiss, Switzerland to see the Alps that the artist made with C.C. Wong. And there was always this conversation about drawing inspiration from Western mountains as well as the great Chinese mountains, uh, even though I think that the, paint, the big painting looks like it's painted from Brazil. Anyway, uh, and so the, it's now called the Carmel Country Inn, I think, is the name of it. But it was the Dolores Lodge. And so this is an image of a cabin outside of the Dolores Lodge that Paul Mao told me was uh, a freestanding cabin where John Da Chen stayed. And above it are, is the painting of the cypress tree that we're going to see in the movie momentarily. And the other big painting is in a private collection here in the Bay Area from someone who just brought a piece of paper to John Da Chen and in the motel he made this painting. And I said, how long did it take? He said, that was just 20 minutes to make the Lotus painting. So John Michael Sullivan said, well, when all of this activity was happening, he realized that this giant was here and they should do something. So he contacted a cinematographer named Dick Ham. And Dick Ham was then teaching at San Francisco City College. And Dick Ham was a sophisticated guy. He had traveled to Europe during the Second World War when he was in the service, but he managed to get an introduction to Picasso in his studio and took this portrait photograph of Picasso. And you can see Picasso is thin and he's cold because he didn't have heat for the stove. And because of that, this photograph became very renowned and it became Dick Ham, even though he was a cinematographer in Hollywood and did all this work, he became best known for his photograph of Picasso. Then this will come up in a minute. When we see the film, which is again the, about the painting of a tree, uh, one of the images that you will see, because as Zhang Da Chen said, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to work with you on making this film, but what I want it to be about is the trees that I love, why I am moving here. I love the trees on the Monterey Peninsula. And as you look at his paintings, this is a painting in the That's collection the of uh, Wilma Ng. And you see the, the, the gnarled tree. So many of the trees reference a specific tree that was on the beach in Carmel. And I'm not going to say anything, but when you see the painting, excuse me, you see the film, and there's the gnarled cypress on the beach, this is the specific reference that became kind of a marker of his California period. As Arnold mentioned, we did this exhibition called Zhang Da Chen Se Jia Zhou, and this is the signature image that we used uh, from the Gao family collection in Hong Kong because it is, although it is referencing a classical work in the National Palace Museum collection, it is also referencing El Capitan in Yosemite. And this is Zhang Dachen in front of his first house, which he called Ko Yi Ju, or barely inhabitable. Uh, and he bought that house in 1968. So again, if you think of El Capitan in this cloud moving by, I want you to think about Ansel Adams and the El Capitan and the cloud moving by from 1948. Ansel Adams was a great fan of Chinese painting, and the night that they finished Here's my story. The night that they finished the filming of August 28, 1967, there was a big banquet to celebrate. And of course, if Zhang Dachen often had a big crowd of people around him. So there was Zhang Dachen and his wife, Xu Wen Po. And there was Michael Sullivan and his wife, Quan. And there was the photographer, Ansel Adams, and there was Long Chin Sen was there, and of course the cinematographer Dick Ham, and more. 
And during the conversation, because of course most of the conversation happened in Chinese, Ansel Adams and the cinematographer Dick Ham were kind of left out. So they talked because they were speaking in English. And Ansel Adams said to Long Chin, excuse me, Ansel Adams said to Dick Ham, well, you know who this really is that you're, you just finished filming. Zhang Dachen, you know, he's known as the Picasso of China. And Dick Ham said, Michael Sullivan never told me he was the <laughs> <laughs> I'm only getting paid $500. Well, $500 in 1967 was really significant. I've never told this story out loud before in a public place, but everybody's in heaven now, so I feel like I can hear the story. So Dick Ham and Michael Sullivan immediately had an argument. <laughs> Dick Ham said, I want $5,000. And Michael Sullivan said, I'm a college teacher. I don't have $5,000. This is for education. We don't have a distribution plan. There's no, there's no economic incentive for this whatsoever. But Dick Ham realized that it would have great value. And by the end of the evening, they never spoke to one another again. So the film... Michael thought was lost. He thought it was destroyed. But when we started researching for this exhibition, uh, my good friend and I went to see Dick Ham, and he set it up in his garage. And he said, I have the original footage. And we said, well, what would it take to get the original footage? And he said, tell Michael Sullivan I want five. <laughs> and Michael Sullivan said, uh, Mark, I'll send you a check. But just make sure he gives you the film footage first. <laughs> so again, I wanted to just show this image, but look at also Long Chin Sen's photographs and his incredible connection. And of course, he, he, he was totally inspired by the work of Zhang Dachen. And this is, in a way, an homage. And this photograph, I can't really believe it, is dated 1989. So he was nearly 100 years old, you know, making this because, you know, he lived to be 104. But what I was so always wanted to ask about and was curious about uh, was a story that Sister Asha told me. And Sister Asha told me, he sa she said, well, you know, when you look at Long Chin Sen's photographs, there are many pictures of birds, but there's only a few with parakeets. And you know what they're about, don't you? And I said, no, I have no idea. And he said, my mother Joan kept parakeets. And he photographed the parakeets. And I think he liked to flirt with Joan. So he created these scenes with parakeets. And every time he came, he would share the photographs of the parakeets with my mother. And they had such a wonderful enjoyment about this. So we were talking about the parakeets. And um, I just wanted to share that story with you tonight. So here's Long Chin Sen's own portrait photograph. Michael Sullivan took portrait photographs that day, Long Chin said. It's an incredible day. It des deserves an entire book. But now I'm just going to uh, take us back to, again, the China Art Center where I would sit here as we would have many conversations with Joan and Francis, Sister Asha. And this is not on display downstairs. And we asked Sister Asha to write the story of this for the 1999 exhibition catalog. And her writing is so beautiful, uh, but I'm, and I'm not going to read it, I'll just paraphrase it now. Uh, and she said, because again, for months at a time, Zhang Dachen stayed at the Dolores Lodge. So when he got ready to pack up to move to, if he was going back to Brazil or New York or Europe or where, Taiwan or wherever he was going, Thomas Chu said, make sure you have everything, repeatedly, make sure you've got all your stuff. And he said, we have everything and left. And then they sent Francis to go check. And she came and said, no, there was a painting here that was left. So her dad ran and said, no, we found the painting. And Thomas Chu was told by Zhang Dachen, that's not my painting. I didn't paint it. I don't know about that painting. <laughs> so was it a test of connoisseurship? Because of course it's not just <laughs> painting. It's so stylistically connected, although it isn't signed. Or she said, or was it 
maybe a test of our loyalty or honesty? And she said, but I recognize. Zhang Dachen had that playful spirit, and it was all of those things and more that he made in the sly remark. And then she said, and for those people who understood that humor, no explanation was necessary, but if you didn't, no explanation was possible. <laughs> so those are the words of Sister Asha. And we tried to find many of these unique works. You know, Zhang Dachen painted with acrylic paint, he painted on plywood, all during this sort of experimental period, but there was one painting on fiberglass. And he found fiberglass sheets in a hardware store in Carmel. And his finger paintings from the 60s are so strong. And this was a finger painting on fiberglass. But of course, you know what fiberglass is like. So when he ran his fingers across it, he literally cut his fingers on the glass. So he said, this is a unique work. He wouldn't be doing that again. And I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I was very honored Sister Asha pulled many of these, all the works by Zhang Dachen from the vault to show. And some things were not appropriate because they were not California period works, but this work seared itself into my mind. And when I first saw it, just this incredible line, the fine, fine line of the art of the scholar's arms that are just reaching, it has this incredible uh, sense of completeness that mark, sort of match the shape of the tree. I remember this so clearly, so I was hoping I would get to see it again, and it's on display downstairs. I think a wonderful show would be drawings of Rembrandt and ink by Zhang Dachen, because they both are so strong and moving. And I just wanted to end with talking about some of the giants for us in 1999. There were so many wonderful people who came out and participated, like Cahill and Sullivan, C.C. Wong. Uh, and the real reason this happened was because we had the wenpo support of the family. Uh, Xu Wenpo said to me, if anyone asks you about this exhibition, tell them you have the support of the entire family. And of course, that made everything so possible. And uh, Zhang Baolo, Paul Chang, who served as a, a deep advisor. And there's Paul Mao as well. So um, they're in heaven now. Uh, but we still have giants that are walking around us. And some giants are in the room tonight. And I thought, well, I just mentioned a few giants for me. Li Huayi lives here. I didn't know Liu Dan would be here. Otherwise, I'd have his work as well. <laughs> Ho Bei Ren at 101 is still painting. Why did Zhang Dachen move here? Yes, it was for the trees, but it was for his friends, too, who were all here. Cecilia Zhang, Ho Bei Ren, who he had known for so long. Fu Wenyan, who I thought might be here tonight, too. Uh, so Fu Wenyan is nearly 100. Uh, hope they run 101, both still working. So it's a great honor to be here, and that's just a little bit of the setup for the film, and we'll watch the film whenever Arnold says it's done. Yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let's film? film, and then we'll talk if we have time. Okay. Isn't it an amazing film? Uh, yes. Just to see how he's Number one, when he says, I'm going to paint this tree. And he, he's directing the film himself, even though. And then just the first mark that he makes, and the speed, the consistency throughout the whole thing is amazing. But what he is loose about, and it, it is, it, every time. I've, I've seen it many times. Uh, and it is, you learn something many times. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I feel it's mesmerizing, really, to watch him paint. And it's, it, I'm really glad there wasn't any narration. Yeah, yeah. You know, just just watch watch this this tree appear out of out of nowhere. <laughs> Wonderful. When did he start painting, and, and who he trained under, or where? From a very <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a long story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, yeah, there's been so many, there's, there's a lot of, you know, material written about John Dutton in, in English and in Chinese, and there's, you know, volumes and volumes, um, so I don't want to get anything wrong, 
but uh, you know he had some very famous teachers. Um, he started and, from yeah. <laughs> one, of, I think one of the amazing things about him, I was thinking about this, is that that uh, you know Zhang Chen we think of. Uh, looking back now as a kind of traditional painter, but what, what he was doing was actually, uh, for his time, in many ways, uh, very revolutionary. Not just the, obviously the splash color and splash ink things we can associate with, you know, abstract expressionism, whatever, but even before that, the, the things he was doing early on were, were uh, quite revolutionary. I mean, he's coming out of a literati, so-called literati tradition, but he also uh, went to Dunhuang, where these uh, ancient uh, Buddhist cave paintings and copied. He, he, he sort of re, um, re-established a tradition of, of Chinese figure painting and uh, was doing things that were, on the one hand, were in the literati mode, but he wasn't afraid to challenge conventions and to, to, uh, to, to rediscover forms of Chinese painting that had been ignored for centuries. Amazing art, the, the the depth and the breadth of, of what he was able to do: fine line, splash color, subject matter, you know, flowers, birds, landscapes, animals, you name it. And uh, actually, it's great because a lot of that is represented in this in this collection. Um, first, I want to say thank you to you both for sharing your stories with us, and also thank Nanhai and. Sotheby's for, for putting on this amazing event. Um, I had a specific question, Arnold, about your encounter with Tom Batchan, um, which you showed photographs of. And what do you remember of that, um, of that, of that encounter? Um, you know, what was John Batchan's spirit like at that time? What was his health like? What did you talk about? Do you remember any of those things? <laughs> It's, it's very funny because I only had that one occasion to meet him, and it's, it's I, I, you know, I'm not kidding. It was like, you know, when I was, I wrote in the catalog a little bit, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had three, three sort of idols. One was uh, Tom Seaver, who was a starting pitcher for the New York, New York Mets, and the other was Walt Frazier, the point guard for the New York Knicks, and the third was this, this crazy Chinese artist who, who just opened my, my world up. And so meeting him, it was like it was having an audience, like having an audience with, with uh, you know, the Pope or something. It was like, uh, he, he was a, a small man in stature, but just so full of charisma. That, and what did we talk about? We talked about, uh, I, uh, I, you know, it's hard to remember. We, it was a short meeting, but uh, I remember introducing my wife, who's from Taiwan. And uh, her, her family is from Yixing, where they, you know, Yixing pots. And, and, and uh, John Le Chan says, oh, you see, that's where Xu Bei Hong is from. <laughs> that, it was that kind of conversation. It wasn't very deep. <laughs> but we walked around the garden a little bit. It was, it was, it was wonderful. Thank you. I wonder what his background was. You know, his parents, mom and father, what did they do? Uh, did they approve of him? <laughs> uh, does somebody... <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Where was he born? He's from Neijiang, Sichuan province, and, and his mother was a painter, and so yeah, his, he was involved was with art from his childhood. Yeah. You answered my question. Thank Long story. <laughs> They're building a museum now for Zhang Dachen in Neijiang. Mm. There's no collection, but they're building a museum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should, I should then mention also, you know, we, we now relate to the splash color, especially in the market, in the world, you know, the, the buyers in China and in Taiwan and Hong Kong and America, you know, everybody likes the, the more modern, splashy ones, uh, which are great. But uh, it should be noted that at the time, uh, a lot of the more traditional uh, collectors and artists uh, found it a little bit too much. Uh, they, they thought he, he would, you know, they, it wasn't, it took, it took a while, it took decades for him to be really recognized for this, creating this style, uh, and, and for people to recognize that it still had close uh, links with, with traditional work, but on the surface of it looked, looked more dramatic. Now, as a kid growing up in New York, it, it was just mind-boggling, you know, it, it, these Splashy lotuses and bright colors, and you know, it's just, it was just really, totally, totally took took me away, and I'm st I'm still going. <laughs>
Just curious, do you know how he and how they met? So they met in Hong Kong uh, in the early 1950s before Ho Bei Ren came to the United States. Uh, and they had maintained their friendship. So uh, Ho Bei Ren's ap old apricot villa, he acquired in 56. 56. So Zhang Dachen was visiting in Los Altos as early as 56 and 54, visiting with Zhang Shu Shi in Berkeley, and again uh, staying at the San Wu Hotel in San Francisco. I was going to say also, you know, this whole literati tradition, you know, there's all these stories of how the paintings came to exist and the background of the moment of when they were made. And there's nobody, I think, that has better stories about how the paintings came to exist than John Dacia. So it's so wonderful because so many of the stories, uh, you know, were, there are backyard stories. Uh, and so many people, you know, it's been such an honor and blessing for me, you know, to talk to Tao Pong Fei and say, oh yeah, we'd have hamburger barbecue in the backyard with Zhang Dachen. It's like somehow it just doesn't <laughs> fit. And then he said, and then he would unroll his newest paintings in the living room on the floor for us. And we were just completely floored. Uh, he was, of course, also a cook a fantastic chef, and he loved to cook, and he was a spectacular gardener, and so he was always directing where the trees would be pruned. I'm told, you know, pointing with his stick, it's like, cut that one, and this one, and this one. Uh, so his home in Pebble Beach, um, there is supposedly a hundred plum blossoms planted there, and there's cherries, and there's a koi pond, and even though the garden is not that huge, it is these rolling hills that you walk through. It's a spectacular place. The huge garden was in Brazil, but he always had that beautiful garden with him. So he was a multi-dimensional great poet, as well as painter in all these different styles. I have a question. In looking at the Chu collection, do you see his hand influencing the other works that were acquired at all, or are those two separate universes? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, he, you'll notice that there's a number of uh, earlier paintings that have John Duchenne's inscriptions on them. So like Ming, Ming Dynasty painting where, where John Duchenne is making commentary. So clearly he had some hand in advising the Jews on uh, what was good, and, and presumably with some of the uh, contemporary, at the time contemporary things, uh, because he knew all of these other artists like Xu Hong and like uh, some of the others. Now, of course, what, what we're showing here uh, downstairs is just a, a small selection of the, of the entire uh, uh, group that's going to be up for auction, so you have to come to New York to see the rest. <laughs> but yes, John Gachin was obviously had had something to do with it. Although you know, I don't think he's responsible for all the decisions necessarily. Uh, there were other dealers and other advisors and, and collectors that the Jews were involved with, uh, uh, where they acquired things. And in some cases, we have records of that. That was a question I had actually, like who's written the book or the article or the story about the um, Chinese diaspora that came to Northern California and really had, you know, w was instrumental in transforming Chinese painting at that time. I mean, we've seen pictures of Zhang Chen and Ho Bei Ren and Fang Gaoling, for example, and, you know, you know Betty Eck, who was uh, in Ooh, Hawaii what? at the time, you know, was here at the time. Who's, who's, Who's written that book? It's all of our jobs to pull all of this together. Uh, you know, we are, I used to say we were sort of a suburb of Hong Kong because of Cantonese being spoken here, but it's something totally different. You know, we are part of, we are a capital of Chinese classical culture in the Bay Area. Uh, and it's all of our responsibilities to keep and build and strengthen it. Um, I mentioned Tao Pong Fei a little while ago, and he, because he had the barbecue, that was that story. You know, he p presented Chinese opera. He called me up and said, Mark, let's bring <laughs> Peking opera to San Francisco State. Well, they did. 
They brought 50 people. I mean, it was ridiculous. And then, you know, the buses drive up right off the airport. We had the most incredible uh, A troupe of the Peking Opera. And, you know, just everybody was hungry. They just got off the plane. So I sent out students to get, I'm embarrassed to admit, bags and bags of McDonald's hamburgers because we just had to feed people so quickly. Because. But it's our responsibility now. They like it. They did the most amazing performance I had ever seen. These incredible flips and laying of the stage, and I knew what the stage was made out of. <laughs> and you know, like jumping from the ceiling and lying flat on your back on a hard wooden stage and all this stuff. And Mad I was there with Madame Zhang, Su Wen Po. And she stood up at the end and she said, very good. <laughs> was Long Jin Chang li living in the Bay Area at the time, or was he kind of back and forth? Uh, there are people here who know more about Long Jin Sen's visit here than I do, so I'll put you in touch afterwards. Okay. Uh, Long Jin Sen, though, had, we were talking about it, you know, Long Jin Sen had a fam, had, I believe it was a son, anyway, one of his 15 children lived in the Bay Area and worked for Pan Am. So Long Chin Sen had a free ticket whenever he wanted to come here. So he was here all the time. And where did he stay? The Dolores Lodge. And some of you know who Janice Mirakatani is from uh, Glide. Janice did this book in 1970 called Ting, the Cauldron. And it was about the depth of Chinese culture in the Bay Area at that time. And they said, in our legendary, you know, native son, Long Chin Sen. I mean, so he was really embraced as a San Francisco photographer. But of course, no, you know, he's the most famous Chinese photographer and lived in Taiwan after 1949. But he was here so often. Uh, and many people knew him and were influenced and inspired by him. Amazing work. Amazing work. Anybody else? Okay. It has nothing to do with the Chu family, but I've been always curious for a long time what's ever become of the status of a painting which I believe was called Along the Riverbank. And there was a controversy as to whether Chiang Kai Chen forged it or it was really an old painting. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let me see it. Uh, you can see it. Is that recent? They've now, they still believe it's, it's uh, it may not be, well, look, the argument was specious to begin with. The, the argument was, uh, uh, Cahill said, it were, well, I should preface this by saying, these are my two teachers, right? C.C. <laughs> Long and, and James Cahill. C.C. Wong believed it to be a 10th century painting by, mm -hmm. by this famous artist named Don Yuan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, James Cahill believed it to be a 20th century painting by this famous artist named John Da Chen. I can say with, with almost certainty that my teacher was wrong. <laughs> Why? And, in fact, I'm pretty sure that both of my teachers were wrong. <laughs> So, you can tell me there was another artist involved? <laughs> well, I don't think it's a John Dutch and Fortune, is what I'm saying. Mm. But I don't think it's necessarily a 10th century painting by Tony mm. There's a thousand years there. It could be, yeah. you know, it, as if it, it made the field, it made a laughing stock of the field, as if we can't tell between a 10th century painting and a 20th century painting, you know, a thousand years. That's, that's a little bit too wide a range. But Cahill <laughs> said that Cheng Dei Chen was that good that he could do it. You could put it that way, I suppose. But no, I, I personally, I don't, I, I yeah, I, I, I actually, that was one of the exam questions uh, that we had uh, when I was a student of Cahill's at Berkeley. It was a take-home portion of the exam. And we had to, uh, to determine what we thought this painting was and date it based on uh, comparable examples and so forth. Uh, and to, to James Cahill's credit, it wasn't, it wasn't about getting the answer that he believed. 
Uh, it was about the, the, the quality of your arguments and the, the comparative materials that you used to bolster your arguments. And this was, you know, uh, actually an earlier, then after we all turned in our papers, uh, he gave an earlier version of his argument that he thought it might be a, a forgery by John Chen. So, uh, what did uh, you determine? I thought it was a Song painting. An early painting, probably 11th century. And I just want to add one thing to that, which is I, t I t entitled the talk The Giants. <laughs> And both Michael Sullivan and James Cahill were such giants. And the way they engaged with not only me, but all of my students was so inspiring. And Sullivan was always like asking those questions. It's like, well, you should do that. You should write. This is your. And so, you know, when we finally got this 600-page reference book about, you know, Asian artists working in the Americas, he said, yeah, that's, he said, now come and talk at Oxford about it, because this is the job that you were born to do. Cahill said, he gave, a, he gave a, this lecture at the Dung Da Chen Symposium, basically saying, I think this is, a, along the riverbank is this Dung Da Chen painting. And then afterwards he said, well, Mark, did I convince you? And I said, well, you know, not really, but uh, he said, well, why not? He said, I'd like to have a conversation with you and continue this so that I, so that we can have this conversation about connoisseurship and I can, any question that you have, let me answer, and we went back and forth. I couldn't believe it. He had not been my teacher, and this was not his egotism. This was his interest to really engage and teach. So... Uh, one thing I do miss in the Bay Area, it's like we, uh, the visibility of these giants like that, that then, you know, the whole world knew that the San Francisco Bay Area was home to these great scholars. And we still have scholars, but they're not quite so public as um, those gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much for this uh, and for uh, the scholarship. So I have to admit that uh, when I was making the introduction, my brain was totally blank. <laughs> probably because of uh, the jet lag. I was just returned from China uh, last week, or probably because of too nervous to see all the turnout, great turnout. But no excuse. I just nervous. <laughs> now I have to do my part. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Arlo, thank uh, Arlo Chang, our friend Arlo Chang, because uh, he helped us to take a long time and uh, thought of this. Without Arlo, this event would not be happening you know, I mean, tonight. So thank you, Arlo. And also thank you for bringing uh, Professor Mark, uh, Martin Johnson. Uh, we are all very familiar here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we have been doing a, a great show for Master Colbert last year. And thank you for deep um, research and for your scholarship. So how about let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and also, uh, I would like to uh, 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 greatly you know, congratulate uh, uh, the professional and also dedicated team at Sotheby's. Uh, my my uh, congratulations goes to uh, Ms. Yung Lung, Vice Chairman of Asian Arts. And, <laughs> and also to uh, Mr. Shen Fang, the head of South, of Chinese Families in New York, the South of New York, who has been leading all these efforts. And also congratulations to uh, your always energetic colleague, Angie. Yeah. It's so impressive, you know, so impressive to, uh, to see this team, you know, uh, you know uh, has been doing such a great job in such a short period of time, you know, a mass collection of works, and also doing the deep research and publish, uh, you know, publishing these great, you know, beautiful and informative catalogs. Yeah. So, thank you and congratulations, you've been a great, great job. You know. Also, my uh, appreciation goes to uh, uh, the Sotheby's team here at San Francisco office. Uh, Jennifer Bailey and the head of office in the system, and also uh, senior coordinator Alexa. It's been such a pleasure to work with you, and I'm already looking forward to our next collaborations. So give them a round of applause.
Das ist auch meine Aufmerksamkeit, die wir noch haben. Das ist auch schon die Idee, die ich schreibe. Das ist immer Code Mailing for the whole events. Thank you for this. Last but not least, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. And the show will still be on tomorrow from 10 to 5. So you're welcome to come back to search, bring your friends, bring your families. But most importantly, as I just said during the beginning, I, 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 I remember that verse. Go to New York, win the bet, and bring the, you know, trade paintings back to California. That's our best tribute to the masters. <laughs> Thank you. That's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.